Okay. So um, I have uh, partially selfish uh, motives for wanting to uh, do the, the well for the Book of Esther together. Uh, one of them is I, I'm sort of planning uh, later this year a, a uh, sermon series on Esther. So I, I figure, you know, mm -hmm. I'll steal all your ideas and uh, yeah. all your thoughts and uh, that'll, uh, that'll make it easy for me. So um, um, that's one of the uh, reasons I want to talk about it. The other reason is it's just a very interesting book. One of the most, I think, one of the most fascinating and one of the most engaging in, uh, in the Bible. It pulls you in, it, it draws you into the story, um, and it's, it's so unusual in some ways. And, um, and, and so I, I hope, you know, we'll kind of enjoy uh, walking through this and poking at the story a little bit. That's sort of the way I think about it poking at this thing and, 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 and prodding it and, and, and trying to see um, without the, the sort of easy answers that we sort of come to sometimes, uh, what, what is this book doing and, and what's it doing in the Bible and, 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 uh, and, and what is it, how do we take this, this story that's set in such a different time and place and, and, and sort of uh, work through it for, uh, for our own lives and our own, uh, our own purposes and our own, uh, uh, our own edification. And so um, that's kind of where we'll start uh, uh, with, this, with, with this book. And I just want to sort of give us an overview uh, this evening and just sort of uh, point out some things that, that we'll be coming back to and looking at as we as we walk through this book. So we, we probably won't get too deep tonight, but uh, that's all right. Uh, we've got some time and I, uh, I just want us to sort of see the big picture of this, of this book. Uh, you probably know the broad outlines of the story. Or maybe, maybe, I shouldn't assume that. Maybe you don't necessarily, and that's okay if you don't. Uh, but, but if you know the broad outlines of the story, you know that it, uh, it takes place in uh, the time in which uh, the, the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel as we know it in the uh, Old Testament is, is really no more. And uh, there are no Israelite kings and, and, uh, and, and they have been taken into Babylonian captivity. The Babylonians have uh, been uh, overcome by the Persian empire. And so, uh, the, the, the book of Esther takes place in this time when Israel, uh, I mean, they, they, they were brought into exile by Babylon, and now another uh, kingdom has taken its place on the world stage, and Israel really had no control over any of that. So that's kind of an interesting background, right? Israel is just sort of, at this point in time, I mean, whoever happens to win the war is who's in charge of it. I mean, think about the struggle of that, right? That, that, that you don't, you don't know who's going to be on the throne next year. You don't know what's going to happen. You, you, you don't have this, this king that you can trust, this kingdom that you can trust. And, and so you're just sort of at the mercy of circumstances, it, it seems. And, and so that's kind of where we pick up in the, in the book of Esther with, with the, the Persian king Xerxes uh, in some translations, Ahasuerus, believe it or not, those are two different ways of uh, uh, transliterating the same word. Um, but um, you, we, we, we start with this, this very uncertain uh, state for Israel. Some of them have gone back to the promised land. There's a, there's a you know, Jerusalem is functioning in some way again. Um, but but still, uh, they're at the whims of these Gentiles, these non-believers, um, and, and uh, are uh, just sort of twisting in, in whichever way the wind is blowing. Uh, and, and Esther is this very personal book, book. It's like Ruth in that way. It's sort of, instead of taking a big view of you know, polit you know, global politics and that sort of thing, it narrows its focus down to a few people. Who are the who are the people that it focuses on? Esther. Esther. Mordecai. Mordecai. 
Yeah. Hey, Haman, the bad guy, the villain of the story, right? Right. Uh, Haman, uh, uh, in, during the Feast of Purim, uh, still today, uh, the, 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 they, they drown out the name of Haman whenever it's read. I, I, I would love to go to a synagogue sometime during Purim and hear the story of Esther read and hear everybody boo and hiss when uh, Haman's name, every time Haman's name is mentioned. The, the villain, that a Haman, the, the bad guy. And then the all-powerful Xerxes, uh, who everybody is dependent upon, right? Everybody has to, to get find favor with the king or else, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. I think, think Haman's been compared to Hitler. Yeah. You know, there's some parallels you can draw there, trying to get rid of all the Jews. So, yeah. So, um, you, you have these, these very vivid characters, these very vivid people who... who, who uh, this whole story sort of turns on the things that they do and that happen to them. And, and that's something I very much want you to see. Uh, nobody is really shown as in total control of what's going on, right? Everybody's at the mercy of something or someone else. And, uh, and so that's, that's the, the sort of background. Uh, who does not appear in as God is not mentioned in Esther, unless you're reading what we refer to as the Apocrypha, uh, where there is uh, there are some uh, additions, we can say additions to the book of Esther uh, that uh, are more overtly religious. And in fact, you could argue uh, that might be why they exist. Um, but uh, it, as, as we have it in our Bibles, probably, uh, God is not mentioned specifically in Esther. It's interesting. There is a place where uh, Esther encourages uh, Mordecai and the other Jewish people in the city of Susa where they live to fast for her. I mean, that's a perfect place to throw in and pray, right? <laughs> and yet, prayer isn't mentioned. Fasting isn't mentioned. Our fasting is mentioned, not prayer. God isn't mentioned specifically in the book of Esther. And that's given some people problems. Um, Esther has been disputed as, as being canonical uh, throughout uh, uh, both the Jewish communities uh, in, in the past and also uh, Christian communities. Martin Luther was not at all convinced uh, Esther should be uh, in, the, in the canon at all. Um, Esther is, I believe, the only book that is not represented in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, leading some to, spe to speculate that the community at Qumran that, uh, that uh, was responsible for the creation of those scrolls did not consider Esther um, canonical. It would make sense that they might not, or they might struggle with it because Qumran was very much a separatist community, right? And Esther is almost the opposite of that. Uh, whatever uh, separatism might entail, Esther uh, goes the other way for most of the, of the book. So, uh, you can see how that might give, give some folks problems. Uh, so, so those questions exist, and, and, and we, we struggle with them, perhaps, and, or maybe we don't. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we, uh, as we go through the book. What happens to these people? Uh, well, there's uh, the, the, the Gentile king who wants a new queen. Uh, Esther happens to be uh, beautiful. Her name, by the way, uh, either uh, comes from the Persian for star or uh, it could be a reference to Ishtar, the, the goddess Ishtar. Uh, the Babylonians uh, and uh, the Persians were, well, kind of famous for uh, renaming people after their own gods. Uh, Mordecai is probably a, a reference to a Babylonian god, Marduk. Um, and so uh, it might be that Esther and, and uh, Mordecai didn't even control their own names particularly. Uh, we all know Esther had a Jewish name. What was it? Adasa. Adasa was her Jewish name. He was a uh, murderer, I believe. Or Some point. Violet. Don't forget uh, Queen Vashti. Queen Vashti is, is where we begin, right? <laughs> Vashti, what, what does Vashti do to make the king angry? <laughs> She refused to appear before him. With she refuses friend. to appear before him and uh, several thousand of his closest friends, perhaps, uh, uh, because he wants to show her off. Uh, 
ladies, I, I don't know how how flattered you'd be if your husband wanted to show you off like that. Your drunk of husband. Drunk <laughs> husband and drunk friends, right? And and uh, you know, uh, Vashti says, "No, thank you. I don't believe I want to participate in that." And for her trouble, she is deposed as queen. Uh, kind of funny. Uh, it makes you snicker. It's not funny, but it does make you snicker a little bit. The the remember the. Uh, the rationale for deposing her? I just was looking at that. Um, one of the king's advisors said, you know, it, it, when it gets out that she refused to uh, obey you, all the other women in the kingdom are going to uh, get ideas that, oh, well, maybe I can defy my husband too. Maybe I can have an opinion. And, <laughs> and, 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 and right. And, of yeah. unrest yeah. and problems because of these uh, women who are, you know, thinking that they can uh, do what they want. Yeah, right, right, right. These these women who have, uh, have the gall to imagine that they can have agency themselves, and that I don't ever do. And so, uh, so the king has to do something. They say, and so what he does is depose Ashi. Uh, there are Jewish traditions that say uh, when the text says that. Uh, that the king wanted her, ordered her to appear uh, wearing her crown, uh, that that was all she was to wear was her crown. Now, we, we don't know that from the, uh, uh, from the text itself, that's, that's tradition, but it probably does sort of capture some of the intent behind it, right? And, and, uh, and so, uh, so she says, I, I have no interest in, 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 in doing that. It, it almost looks like she's supposed to be sort of the 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 the, the biggest reveal I mean, he, he's he showed off his whole kingdom he showed off his wealth um herodotus talks about xerxes uh trying to invade greece and, and trying to conquer greece uh and and so a lot of uh, a lot of commentators speculate that uh, he's doing this to sort of fire up his <coughs> soldiers and his administrators and his uh, finance guys uh, to to finance and to support this expedition to Greece that winds he, up being. A he's in the battle. battle. He he's in the battle of three hundred. Yeah, he is. He is. If you've ever seen the movie three hundred, or uh, no, yeah, he, well, he, I I would recommend the History Channel version of yeah. three hundred. It's on YouTube. Yeah, right, right. It's, yeah, there, there's a, there's a, a yeah, right. It, the, the movie itself is not very uh, historical, but. Uh, but it does it does show that this this he, he was very interested in conquering Greece, expanding his empire even more, and uh, and so some commentators think that the 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 showing off at the beginning of of Esther uh, is related to, to wanting to carry on that campaign. Well, but there's there's also that sets the stage to explain how Esther ends up acting because apparently she's learned from what Vashti's experience was. Yeah. So she's going to act in a much more submissive, some would say manipulative, um, subtle way to get her ends, which may well, be actually reason. a consequence of a lot saying women can't actually speak their mind. People who can't, then end up finding other ways to basically get to the same end, um, which are not as forthright or honest, really. Um, without criticism of Esther, you wonder sometimes why she's doing all of these things in sort of a roundabout way. Well, I think the story sets that up for you by showing what happened when Vashti mm -hmm. did something more directly. For sure. Uh, I can't. I can't help but think that Vashti was ready to get out of there. To be honest, <laughs> yeah, you got to think she she was not really loving her role as queen. Uh, in any in any case, um, I, I suppose she. I mean, I su what Vashti does is actually quite brave. We point to Esther's bravery pretty often. What Vashti does is actually quite brave in in defying. Her husband, who happens to be the king of the world, basically, uh, and 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 refusing this request of him. Uh, I mean, I, 
I suppose being deposed was probably about the best outcome she could hope for. She's in that, lucky she and, was in that, in that uh, so so you do you don't want to gloss over Vashti too quickly uh, because she she I mean she makes a a pretty powerful statement by just refusing. I just refuse to play by the rules. Uh, remind you of you know. Rosa Parks or people like that who, who don't have much power, it seems, but who just say, no, enough. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to play that way. I'm not going to, I'm not going to obey this, this stupid rule. And, uh, and in so doing sort of, um, subvert, you know, what, 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 uh, what is expected and, and what, what, what society wants. And you see that in the reaction of the king and his advisors. She can't do that. <laughs> um, well, it turns out she can. Um, well, well, but let's keep in mind that what she was being asked to do could have been probably pretty outrageous given the morals of the day. Yeah. I mean, women even recently secluded in a harem, right, to, to display probably more than what we would think um, could have easily gone um, beyond what was deemed moral um, under the circumstances for a woman to do. And uh, um, I, th there are other women who have refused such kinds of um, attacks on what is appropriate. Not yeah. today, but, you know. Um, so, um, because of those events, uh, we have this uh, uh, search for a new queen, and that's when Esther uh, comes in. Does it bother you that uh, Mordecai just seems to go along with this whole thing? Mordecai's our guardian, right? We know that. Uh, we, uh, cousin, uncle, uh, there's some debate uh, about that, but, but definitely her guardian. Uh, and and seemingly uh, a cousin um, who, you know, what do you think about him just letting her enter into this, you know, this, uh, if it was today, it'd be on like reality TV. It'd be like, you know, the, the, you know, the queen or something. And, you know, the, you'd have this, this uh, whole, um, you know, ideal search. Well, what do you think? It seems very irresponsible. Seems irresponsible. This is okay. not a beauty contest. She is going to be put into a harem. And that is not, well, that's the dark story of the story. Do you think of any, of the, any of the parents of these girls had any choice? And, and that's the question, isn't it? What, what choice in the matter well, exactly? Guiding this, he's guiding her. Uh, well, yeah, but he's accepting the reality that yeah. there's nothing he can do about it. You know, they, they sent the well, king. The king sent people out into the king into the kingdom to look for pretty girls to bring back for him yeah, to uh, you know, take stackers. his choice. But whatever, it does seem a little irresponsible because he knew what was going on. This is a dark part of the story. We know why he was perhaps okay with it later. Yeah, in his state of mind. Which is probably <clears throat> arguably the most famous verse in the book. Later, yeah, later, later on, it sort of he sort of feels like maybe, you know, maybe there's a reason you're in this position, and, and maybe it's to, to save your people. Um, but and going in, he didn't know that, and I I, I don't know. I, I think it's I think it's uh, an open question as to how uh, how comfortable. Uh, and I, I think whatever level of comfort or discomfort you have with that is okay. I, I you know I. I I do think there's something sort of ugly about it, right? That that uh, something very ugly about it. That he he just sort of seems to roll right along with this. Um, could he have done? Yeah. Could he have done anything? Is is is, yeah, is the question? Right, right. It, it's Christine. the it's the same it's the same ugliness of um, you know Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. Take, don't take these men. Take my daughters. I mean, right. it's. It's reflective of how many people thought of women, but it shouldn't be glossed over. Yeah. What, what they were, what they were doing, whether 
he had control over it, not. It is a context of the story. And it really makes it rather odd that we turn it into things like veggie tales and <laughs> and stuff yeah. like that, because how do you explain it? I mean, it, <laughs> how, how do you honestly explain it? It, it, it's it's hard it's hard as a children's story i think very hard and we don't i can remember as a like fifth grade uh studying esther in bible class and my mom was one of the teachers and and she was talking she, you know they were they were sort of uh, uh picturing it as like you know the miss america pageant or, <laughs> or something and, and you know as you read the text a little more closely you realize that ain't exactly the the the, the sum of it and uh, it is. It, it's. It's. It, it demonstrates the the sort the, the 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 idea of women as property that were that seemed to be uh, prevalent in, in uh, most of the world at, at one time or the other, and certainly uh, at, at that time in ancient in the ancient Near East. But, but um, for for these reasons, it is important to realize God is not mentioned in this story. Yeah. It is never said that this was the will of God that right. we participate right. in this. It would, it's never said that God endorsed or told Mordecai to do what he did. Um, it is never said that God approved any of the decisions that happened. That's correct. It is never said that God acts to ensure his people will not be slaughtered by somebody in a government, which would be very problematic. Um, given the events of but, the 1940s. But I think, but I think so, people so we, take that lettuce lesson away from it. Well, so, so we've got to be careful. Right, and, and the don't. Bible is full of messy stories where <clears throat> people do things and God may turn it around or it just happened that way. It doesn't mean what happens in the Bible is always what God wants. That's right. And, That's and right. it's obvious in this story, but it probably applies in other places as well. And so we have to really be careful about the times where God says this versus this happened, I think. One of the things Esther, the book of Esther does is it just takes this unflinching look at these events and just, there, 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 on many of the events, many of the things that are done, the decisions that are made, there is, it, it's just how it was. It's just how it happened. Now, there's definitely a good guy and a bad guy, right? And we're supposed to see Haman's uh, uh, choices as invalid. And, and, uh, but, but that doesn't mean that everything that happens, as you, as, you, as you guys have said, that doesn't mean that everything that happens is exactly what God wanted to happen. Uh, and, and so uh, we, we, we are left with a very, you use the word Christy, messy story that that doesn't always satisfy our desire to find an easy lesson in the, in the text for us. Um, and so, so as we as we go, we're gonna we need to think about that. We need to consider what this book is doing on its on its own terms. You know, how it, what is this book doing? Why is it here? And 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 it's well. There's one way to answer that question. It's there because. Uh, Jewish people found something in it that 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 if not inspired them or, or it, that that helped them to make sense of the world that they lived in. And <laughs> and keep in mind that the Jews uh, were in bondage to a succession of kingdoms, and it's very possible that that uh, Esther, as a book, took shape. Uh, during the Persian conquest or during the Greek conquest, either one, uh, Israel is under bondage to a foreign nation. They're, they're, there's doubt about their future and their maintaining of their identity. And Esther, uh, the book of Esther, uh, gives them some sense of, uh, some way to make sense of all that. Um, and so, so, so yeah. all that being said, um, that God is not, said. Um, I think we ought to also recognize the context for the broader context here, and we see it in Daniel, and we see it in some other instances. I mean, there are some passages in the prophets when God's talking about the exile, 
where there's a flat out acknowledgement that the Jews are not going to be able to do everything that God wants them to do. Yeah. Right. They're not going to be able to keep kosher, probably. They're not going to be able to do a variety of things. Um, so when you're in this situation and things are not in your control, um, well, God does seem to recognize that that's the case, um, right, um, sometimes and the like. So um, we can't be too critical either when people are faced with very difficult choices um, that we have not been faced with as to how to maneuver in, in this type of situation. And as I said, there is some indication that God understood that that was going to be the case. And Esther is right in the middle of it. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, that I think as, as we kind of do some preliminary stuff here with Esther, one of the things we, we need to recognize, uh, well, let me put it this way. Uh, I, I love the stories of God like intervening miraculously, right? And, and doing, doing something. I, I think those are, those are great. Those are inspiring. Um, very often in my life, it feels closer to Esther than those stories. Do you, do you know what I mean? Um, that, that you don't see God, you know, parting the heavens and, 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 and intervening in specific ways. I mean, I think we can all say we've seen situations that, that we probably in our faith would attribute to God's intervention, but at least for me, that's not the norm. And and very often what you see when you look at the world is it's messy, it's ugly, and you really don't see God. <laughs> you know, and he, he, you're not, he, he's not front and center. And, and even we acknowledge that when we say things like, but we believe that God is in control. I said it in my prayer, I think, tonight, right? We believe that God is in control. When we say that because... We don't always see it right, that way, right? What, what we see sometimes is things are, are ugly and where's God? And, and, and Esther, I think, helps us to live with that reality and to, to see that and to recognize that that, that happens in the world. And, and what do you do? How do you then continue and go forward when you don't see God uh, specifically at work. Um, and, and so as we read this story uh, and as we, as we read, as we read through this story, I, I, I take seriously that God's not there, at least that we see. And, and, and let's, let's try to be honest about that and upfront about that as, as we read through this story. Um, because there's places where he could intervene, right? And and yet we don't see it. And and, and so and and I think there are places in the story where very often people of faith go, well, that was God. And it may have been, but the story, the, the text doesn't tell us that. And that's very often my life too, right? <laughs> uh, where, where I will say, I think that was God, but I don't know that. And, and I don't know that, and that, that doesn't mean that I can be confident that it, every, that the next thing is going to work out the way I hope. Uh, and so what do you do with that as a person of faith? What do you do? With that? And, and so that, that's kind of where I want us to, 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 to begin as we, as we, as we go through this story. Um, uh, Patrick, yes, excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> I mean, shouldn't we ask for God's help in situations, even though we we know He's, you know, we can't see Him or sure. feel Him, but we should have a sense that He is present. Yeah, I do. That's I, the way too. I think anyway. Me too, and, and I, 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 absolutely, we should ask for God's help and and for we should pray about situations that we're in, but we also recognize the way that sometimes. Those prayers seem to go unanswered, even though we know no is an answer. Okay, <laughs> but you know, but it's not the answer I was looking for, and and, and it's it's it, it, it's hard to distinguish sometimes from no answer at all, uh, if, if we're being honest. 
And so that's kind of where Esther leaves us, I think. I, I get the sense that the way Mordecai and Esther are being represented is that they're kind of people who, it's not that they don't believe, they just have kind of stopped or have never started really looking for God's presence and for God's intervention. Um, because you certainly don't, don't see them referring to that and, and you don't see them responding in that way. Uh, when, when Mordecai hears the news of, of uh, Esther, of, of uh, Haman's plot, he wears sackcloth and ashes and he fasts. And say great. Yeah. I, 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 you get just get the sense that, and not in a, I'm not trying to be insulting, they just seem to be sort of in a, a mindset of kind of secular, this is the way things are, and we gotta we gotta work with it. It's not that they don't believe in God, I, 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 that's not really addressed. It's just they don't seem to think he's right there with. What do you think? Yeah, uh, uh, Patrick? Yeah. I, I think the book of Esther is, I mean, here to show us the another mystery of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The hidden, the hidden side of God doesn't mean the absent of God. No, because <coughs> God was not mentioned in the book. Yes, but that means that's the side of hidden. But um, Esther and he, her uncles, the way they hold things, if chapter four of the books show us how they call on the entire Israeli to fast and pray, whom did they pray to? They pray to God, and they know the answer will be yes. And indeed, the answer was, I mean, yes. Though God was not mentioned, that means it's the hidden part. But still, the presence of God is in, in there. That's proved to us that no matter how things go around us, we should normally know once we demand on God, God will never leave us. He always there for us. When we call on him, he will answer. This is what I know about this book. I, I think Esther is a book that if, if you come into it expecting to see God at work, you'll see it. Correct. And I think also if you come in to Esther, reading the book of Esther and you don't necessarily expect God to be at work, you'll see that too. I think we very much bring our own assumptions about God and how he acts into our reading of this book. Uh, and maybe that's the intent, I don't know. But but if, if you were a completely secular person and you, who didn't believe in God perhaps, and you read the book of Esther, what might you come away with? You know, how, how might you, you know, how might you respond to it? What, what might you see in that book? Um, um, go ahead. You that God is placing people where He wants them. That's what I see. He got Esther right there. He's got Mordecai right there. He even has Haman, the bad guy, playing. He put this whole play together. You know? And Mordecai almost says that, but he doesn't say that, <laughs> right? <laughs> Who knows? But that you might have come to royal position. For such a time as this, but we might have some faith. But I think if we've been through all the Jews have been through, our faith wouldn't be very strong either. I'm not, and I'm not just being critical of, of of Mordecai or anybody. I just think it's a book that you you very much when you, what what you bring into it is is as how you read. Go ahead, Chris. Well, I'm not a completely secular person. I don't think maybe someone disagree with me, but I actually think that I mean if Esther hadn't been so good at becoming 
the chosen queen, then Mordecai might not have been at the gates to make Haman mad, to set off the whole decision to kill the Jews to begin with. Now, I'm not saying it's Mordecai's fault, but there are a whole lot of this causes this with an unintended consequence and an unintended consequence that could have been nothing to do with with God. I, I mean, I don't want to take away because I, I do think it belongs in the Bible, but we don't usually, I don't think we look at the fact that Mordecai is the one that told Esther, don't bow down. I mean, don't admit that you're a Jew and yeah. then let people know at the gates that he's a Jew because he yeah. won't bow down to the king. I mean, there are a whole bunch of things in this book that don't equal each other and result in some of the consequences that happen. And I think we do that all the time, right? We do all kinds of things that we think are the right thing to do that result in terrible consequences. I think that's an important thing, but I don't think we can say that it's obvious to me what what was supposed to happen here. Does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, one question you can ask as you read this, why didn't Mordecai just bow down to Haman? Well, what was wrong with that? It, it wasn't. It, it's it's almost certainly not because he regards it as an act of worship that he should only because you know he. I mean, there are all sorts of references through Scripture for to Jewish people bowing before other people, right? I mean, that that doesn't seem to be something that you can't do. And, and Esther yet, apparently was supposed to do bow it. Bow down to this guy. Now Haman's a jerk. Okay, Haman's going to do what Haman wants to do. But Mordecai, it's like he intentionally provokes. Why in the world doesn't he just bow down to this guy? We'll talk about that as we get to it. Their theories, their thoughts. But but why in the world does does he do that? Uh, a couple it, things. Really, it becomes a squabble between two men that just sort of spirals out of control, <laughs> at least the way... You and a read. ludicrous king that can't make any decisions for himself, apparently. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. It's just sort of a whole mess. And <laughs> and so it, it it bears repeating. A, a what couple things. Um, do it so, in our body? Go ahead, bro. Yeah, yeah. So um just in, in my own life, um, I guess now back seven years ago, you know, I was looking for a job and a job came along and in a way that I have said, I feel I felt like this was something that God brought about, that I got this job at just the right time, at just the right moment and the like. And I've, I've related that. And uh, to my surprise, Christy's smiling, uh, my, my kids say, I don't get that. You were just the best qualified person. Um, you know, uh, you could say the same thing. Um, Esther was made queen because she was the prettiest and the one who knew how to manipulate the king the best. Um, she's pretty mm -hmm. good at it. I, I, I mean, and the the whole thing is a clever Jewish person um, managing to manipulate events to avoid a, a, a terrible outcome. Um, we have a whole series of stories where the clever person wins. Um, you know, that's not uncommon either. Um, is God behind it? I don't know. But I do think we have to take the fact that, sort of on a second thing, we have no evidence that in exile, in Susa, that Mordecai was feeling the presence and the movement of God in events and in his life. I mean, he, yeah, that was my point earlier. Yeah. Yeah. He never says that. And, you know, this is a period in Judaism where, um, maybe people weren't feeling the presence of God. And so actually the interesting thing is, right, in this context, most Jews ended up doubling down on belief, even though they weren't feeling it. And this is the rise of synagogue Judaism that really continues to today. This is the point where Jews actually make the decision, whether we feel it or not, this is what we're going to do. So maybe Mordecai is an early cultural Jew um, in, in that sense. But 
you know, the other, the, to flip it back again, just because you don't feel God doesn't mean he's not with you right. and near you. So it's like the thing with my job, you know, you look to who's looking at it and one thinks it is, <clears throat> another, I don't think that follows. Yeah. Um, and I, I think we're left to intuit. I do think we have to be careful in not putting a, a, a feeling of the presence of God on somebody who, for all intents and purposes, does not seem to be relying on that or, or feeling that um, here. I think the why we have this persistent temptation as human beings to assume that God is going to act in some sort of supernatural way. Right. When we don't believe that he has set up the natural order of things. Yeah. Too. I mean, it's, the whole book of those things is logically inconsistent. Yeah. And in fact, we have way more instances in Scripture of God acting through natural processes. The New Testament writers, especially going back and attributing all sorts of things to God that were attributed to God by the people that lived through them contemporaneously because they didn't see it. They were waiting for something to work out of the ordinary. But yeah. The reason we have those miracles that are out of the ordinary in Scripture, I think, one explain why is that they're rare. Yeah. Most of the time, not God does make it. Yeah. So this is a perfect example of God acting in a completely different setting than we normally associate with. And, and this is why I think Esther is a book that, that can speak to where we are and, and to the world we live in. That, 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 you know, <laughs> Ron, if you, if you believe your job came from God, that's great. Not everybody's going to share that, right? <laughs> and, Apparently and, not. And you know what? God's probably not going to prove it one way or the other. <laughs> and, and, and so we're left with those questions and those uncertainties. And we're left with, you know, people, people's motives and, 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 and the way people uh, have their agendas that they, they want to accomplish. And, and you know, I, I'm reminded of Paul talking about the, those who preach the gospel out of uh, a desire to make trouble for him. And we don't know exactly what that meant, but but he, he certainly believed that there were people who, they didn't have the best motives in, in preaching the gospel. And then he said, but you know what? The gospel's preached. <laughs> and so I'm not going to worry about that. I'm not going to try to iron all that out. I'm not going to try to shake out who's right and who's wrong. I'm just going to say, praise God when the gospel's preached and for whatever motives. And, and, and I believe that that, that has power. Um, as so, long as we don't take the flip side and say, you know, you didn't get that job. God must not have wanted you to have it. That prayer wasn't answered. God didn't want you to get your loved one to get well, must not have been God's will. Right. I mean, that's the flip side. And that's really dangerous for faith, I think, for some people anyway. Yeah, you know, I, I think as we talk about this, you know, <laughs> did, did God, you know, what, what was what was God and what was I think we can say God didn't want his people to suffer a genocide, right? That, that was not something God God wanted and 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 was trying to create uh, a, a, a channel for. Um, I, I think we recognize that, but but exactly what he did and how <laughs> Esther does not answer it and seems to have no interest in answering that in any real concrete way. And, and so I, I want us, as we, as we go through this book, to, uh, to, to take that seriously. So we'll be coming back to that quite a lot. <laughs> and we may, there may be some debate sometimes uh, about exactly uh, you know, what happens and why, and that's okay. I, 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 think one of the, I, I, per, I think perhaps one of the reasons this book exists is to generate exactly those kinds of conversations exactly those kinds of, of questions and debates because I think that can help us as we as we sort of grapple with the uncertainties of our own life and our own world um, yeah, but would we say because God's not mentioned in the book of Esther that God is not in the book of Esther and that's uh, what I'm hearing and I'm wondering if according to the individual state when comments again, written, and, I, and think, I think about the scripture that says God sets up times, places, and dates for people to reach out and find him. So I think 
the careful or the, the measured way to look is it's according to the faith of the reader. If I'm the reader, right? Mm-hmm. That if, if I just because the name of God's not mentioned in there, that I don't see God. I don't know. I'm, I'm asking a question because I feel like that's and, and one of the because he's not mentioned. That's that's one of the things I meant when I said it's kind of what you what you bring into this book <laughs> that mm-hmm. that you'll see if you, if you come in like I I read Mordecai say. Who knows but that you have come to loyal position for such a time as this. I read that, and I'm sorry, I can't help but thinking to myself, God put it there somehow. <laughs> God, God had something to do with it. But the text doesn't say that. And so I think we got to be real with the fact that the text doesn't say that, while also allowing that we might come to different conclusions about it. And, and then that, I, I think that's okay. But then that takes us, and this is a question, but then that takes us to the Bible being the Bible, then do we say that that is not of God? Because then we start chiseling away at what we want to keep as of God because something is said or isn't said or implied or not implied when the the word is the word. Yeah, we could ask the covers or whatever. And we say definitely that there's any part of this world in which God is not present, in which his influence is not felt, but I think the answer to this, no. Yeah, I, I wouldn't even, say that. Yeah. Even in the situations that are motivated by the darkest evil on our part, God can still act, and his influence can keep that from being something that's utterly hopeless. Yeah, and, and we don't always know how. We, we, don't, we can't always see how. And, and, and again, that's, that's the uncertainty that I'm pointing to. I mean, to, let, to respond to your your, your question, I, I think there's plenty in scripture that attributes specific qualities and actions and, and, and power and uh, purposes to God. And, and I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think there's, I mean, I think we all would recognize there's plenty of places in scripture where that, that occurs. And Esther's not one of those places where, where there's a lot that's said about what God is up to in the middle of all this. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yes, what you're saying. Mm -hmm. My question is, because it's not much said, does that mean God is omitted from that? That's what I'm saying. That Uh, It's hard for me being the book of, you know, the Bible, and we're saying that because God is not, just really seen or said, or it's not so over that we could take it any kind of way that God is not a part of this. At least that's what I hear us kind of saying. And I'm wondering if, if that's legit, just because it's not so crystal clear that he said this or the implications are there in the Bible. I think what I'm saying is Esther leaves a lot of things open to, to question. And, and, and what God's role in all this is, Esther doesn't really address, I don't think. Well, now, again, there's some places where, where you can certainly, as I said, who knows but that you've come to royal position for such a time as this. I, I mean, that's so close to saying, <laughs> God, you know, God put you, God put you here. God did this. Maybe, um, yeah. Only he doesn't say that. I don't think it uh, puts Esther out of character, uh, out of out of inclusion in the Bible, um, simply yeah. because things aren't attributed to God. There's lots of historical accounts in the Bible and events recited historically as ha- things that happened to God's people in which God isn't specifically mentioned. Um, lots of kings are are told they did this and that and the other, and it doesn't say one way or the other whether God, you know, um, was inspiring them to do one thing or the other. And so if you could just read it as a historical account of a great deliverance of God's people in this city, um, which is actually how it ends, which is they're going to celebrate this, um, this, this festival, but it's not clear even at the end that it was a religious holiday. 
um, per se, but it certainly was something still to celebrate. It was a great victory uh, over enemies of God's people. And um, so I, I don't think it puts you it out of character with the rest of the Bible, regardless of what you do. Um, but if you read God into it too much, you can come into problems as well um, because of how the characters are acting um, in some instances. So we'll have to see it as we as it plays out, right? Yeah, to, I mean, to answer, the, to respond to your question specifically, Colette, I, I, don't, I don't think we should say that God is absent from the events of Esther. I, I don't think anybody should say that. I, I just don't think the book of Esther grapples with that very much. Maybe, maybe it's just assumed. Maybe they thought we'd just assume it. I don't think so because I mean, there, you know, it almost seems intentional. Um, but so I don't think we should say that because he's not mentioned, he's not present at all. Because as that, that as others have said, we certainly do believe he's present, right? We we believe there is nowhere God isn't, and there is well, nothing. Our daily lives, right? Right. I, right. Things happen that I go through the day or around people and we're not saying look what God did but I'm not going to say he's excluded out of my life because yeah. in that instance and in that day and in that moment I wasn't in such a prayerful place or you know carrying myself like a, a saint or whatever the case is that doesn't mean he was absent plenty of times God has blessed me when I wasn't thinking to look for him or expect it or thank him for it, mm -hmm. right? And I think, can't we all say the same thing? And 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 so, you know, I, that's life. That's 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 being human. That that's the struggle we, we deal with. Go ahead. Matt. We have to be comfortable with God acting in situations that He doesn't necessarily want. Yeah. Endorse. Yep. And in fact, we hold personally. Yes. We need to realize that He's doing that all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even though I said God has worked with me and change me, pull something out of this that I can use to change for the better. So it, there are all kinds of bad decisions in this book that God is working to in, in here. So that makes this easier to grapple with. If you're comfortable attributing God's influence to situations that he wouldn't have wanted in the first place, then it's easier to see it there. So, I mean, as we, next week we will Start uh, reading uh, this book together, and and we'll we'll think about and talk about some of these 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 questions, and and uh, I I I I think you'll see if you're struggling right now. I think you'll see uh, how you know what this book can do for us in helping us to uh, ironically come away with a, a faith intact that. Um, That even in the places where we don't see him and don't know what he's doing and don't know how much he's doing, uh, we, we, we as Christians believe that God is present and that he's active and that he is involved in, in the events going on around us to, to one degree or the other and in one way or the other. And even if we never know how, and often we're not going to, most of the time we're not going to, um, there are still reasons to uh, to celebrate and to trust and to hope, and and so um, I'll leave it at that for now. As we need to wind things up uh, next week, also uh, maybe if you get a chance during the week, read through the Book of Esther. It's not all that long. It's a little long, but it's not all that long. So take a couple of take a couple of days, read through the Book of Esther, and and uh, and just sort of get get the lay of the land. And also, as you read, notice feasts. Feasts play a huge role in Esther. And one of the interesting things about the book, the way it's constructed, is the feasts sort of mirror each other in places. And so, uh, so as you read through the book, pay attention to those feasts and, and uh, notice people uh, having parties and, uh, and, and see what's happening there. <coughs> All right. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have Thank you. Good, night. good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. All right. You guys have a good night. Take care. Good night. You too. You too.